Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to my Sunday sermon. This is the third of a series of three um, issues that I'm looking at, which are affecting the church, but in turn, that is affecting the wider society that we live in today, and obviously have an impact on culture and politics as well. And we're seeing how a number of things which are dangerous and harmful and new are affecting both the church and society as a whole. So in the first part of this series, I looked at cultural Marxism, which I've spoken about many, many times before, something that started in society, but then has affected and is impacting the church very much so now, and causing people who are Christian leaders, or actually what I would say infiltrators coming into the church who aren't Christians, are bringing in cultural Marxist ideology into the church and undermining Christianity very, very deeply deliberately and directly. And then last week, uh, the second thing I looked at was a new doctrine of dispensationalism, which is a false teaching that was mainly spread uh, like yeast through bread by the Schofield Study Bible after John Nelson Darby uh, constructed this whole new edifice of dispensationalism uh, around 1830. And that is very, very much affecting the church today. Um, Jesus is coming back. There's no question about that. Jesus might come back this afternoon, but he might not come back for another thousand years. I don't know. Um, But what dispensationalism is doing is it's focusing the church on something that isn't in the Bible, uh, a so-called rapture, which happens seven years before Jesus comes back properly with a seven-year period of tribulation in between. All of this is eisegesis. It's reading into the Bible something that isn't there and ignoring other texts that would give you a whole context of what's happening. Jesus is coming back, but it's reading all kinds of other things into it. Um, And it was mostly um, popularized, as I said, by the Schofield Study Bible, but also by a myriad of books which have made their authors very, very rich. There's a there's a multi-million pound um, Christian fear porn industry today, writing literature and making videos about the end times. And as I said, we might be in the end times but we might not, we are in the end times, as in the sense that the church age is the last age. We are in the end times, the last days, as in we are in the church age, which has been going on since Jesus' um, death and resurrection. Whether Jesus is coming back now or in a thousand years, I don't know. The, the, <laughs> my point is, we need to get on with the jobs that Jesus has told us to do, uh, sharing the gospel with all men and making disciples of all nations and not worrying about whether there's going to be a new world order. I do worry about that a little bit, but that shouldn't be the primary focus that makes us afraid and makes us passive. We have to actively fight against tyranny, oppression, and keep on spreading the good news of the kingdom of God. So that was what um, I was talking about last week. This week I'm going to go on to something which is very, very dangerous uh, in a completely different way, because this is something which is subtly twisting parts of the church, which were known you know, very much uh, today and in the last century as being very alive uh, parts of the church. Uh, particularly uh, evangelical churches, Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches. And uh, they may get a bad press in the West, and and that's understandably so, because there have been many, many excesses uh, over the years from people who have been evangelical preachers who have just got, you know, got, (laughs) <laughs> made themselves rich and have got themselves a private jet and all sorts of things like this and uh, <clears throat> abused their congregations and said things which are false and so on and the televangelists and so on of the past and, and that's that's awful because it gets God a bad name but actually outside the west There are hundreds of millions of people who are evangelical Christians. It's the fastest growing 
branch of the church uh, has been for many, many decades. When I say that, I mean, it's, it's terrible to speak like that. This is a branch of the church. The, the church is the church and Christians are Christians. We are united in spirit. It doesn't matter. You know, I know there are errors in every uh, denomination, but I look at it as though whether you're Orthodox or Catholic or Protestant or Nestorian or Coptic or Syriac, you're all Christian. Uh, you know, there are more errors in some branches than others, but we all have to be humble and uh, realize none of us is perfect. And, um, you know, but also discuss things uh, according to the scriptures. Uh, I am Protestant. I'm not, uh, you know, other, another thing because I believe in sola, sola scriptura as the authority. I, I don't believe in the authority of the Pope um, or tradition. Tradition can be good, but if it's wrong, it needs to, to get it, to get rid of it. Um, you know, I have many wonderful Catholic friends and you know politically we would agree on everything um you know uh, they very much fight uh, for the rights of the unborn child and uh, are absolutely the catholics uh, and orthodox christians are <laughs> seem to be far more uh recognize <laughs> um aware and uh, willing to fight against uh, cultural marxism than many in the protestant churches or evangelical churches today uh, who have been infiltrated anyway that's sort of an aside so what i'm going to talk about today is is something called the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, now, this is a very, very loose movement. It's not an organization as such, although there are people coming together to put you know, firm uh, organizations and networks in place. But it's something that is affecting, I don't know, the majority of churches in the world, but certainly hundreds of millions of Christians who have are evangelical or Pentecostal or charismatic or have some influence um, from these three sort of movements in in Christianity, which have been good over the last two or three hundred years, um, but are now being affected by uh, a, a movement which is really building a counterfeit kingdom. There's a whole book uh, written called Counterfeit Kingdom by Holly. Pivek. Uh, I've just read it and uh, it's, it's very much worth a read to look into some of the excesses and abuses of the new apostolic reformation. What is this, by the way? What is it actually? What is the new apostolic reformation? Because you can, you can look it up and there's a bit of information about it, but so many people who are in it and are influenced by it don't even know that they're being influenced by it. They just become a Christian Okay, they receive the gospel, they're real genuine Christians, and then go to a church um, which has been impacted by the new apostolic reformation. But they themselves don't even sometimes acknowledge that this thing exists. They just, oh, well, this is Christian, it's a movement. Um, but it's not. It is something definite that, um, and the, that was created. And I'll look at, look at some of the key people. Uh, in the movement who have started it or developed it from other things later on and show how it is impacting the church. What it is really, the, the key foundation for this is that some leaders, particularly based in mega churches in the United States, have said uh, or appointed themselves as new apostles and new prophets and are making dec decrees, declarations, pronouncements, and they are saying that what they are, what their pronouncements and their decrees are canonical. They have the same authority as scripture, and what they are doing can change reality. But this is not true because there are only 12 apostles and they were appointed personally by Jesus in the first century. The key Bible text that they use and or they would say they misuse is one, sorry, um, here we go, I'm just, sorry, uh, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, and it, which talks about the 
fivefold ministry, as they would say. It says this in Ephesians 4, 11, 13, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of faith. Okay, so they say that God is re-establishing something called the fivefold ministry, which is written about in Ephesians 4.11. There will be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But this isn't correct, because um, earlier in Ephesians, Ephesians 2.19-21, it talks about the church being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So the apostles and the prophets have passed. The prophets it's talking about here were the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., who wrote the Bible or most of, most of the Old Testament. And the new apostles, Paul... Uh, James, John, Matthew, Mark, etc., the 12 apostles, were the foundation, lead, the foundational leaders of the church in the first century. So they came, they had their apostolic ministry, the church was established, and then you have bishops and deacons and elders. Yes, of course, you still have evangelists and pastors and teachers, but there are no new apostles. The age of the apostles has finished because they obviously passed away in the first century. And the prophets, they wrote the Old Testament. So, you know, they obviously died in the Old Testament times and they lived from around 800 to 400 BC. Now, they did, of course, uh, a unique and glorious work in laying the foundation, uh, the, the prophets look forward to the coming of the Messiah and the apostles after, obviously, they were around with the time of Jesus and then uh, laid the foundation of the church. And then the church foundation was laid. And then we have the church era and we're still in the church era today. But what these people are saying now since about 20 or 30 years ago, is that God is re-establishing a new age of apostles, that he's appointing new apostles, which is complete nonsense. These people who say they are apostles today and lead megachurches, mostly in the United States, are not apostles. And the people who appoint themselves as prophets, who are second in charge uh, to the apostles, are not prophets like the Old Testament prophets. Now, I must say, I do believe in the charismata, the gifts of the Spirit, which are uh, told to us in the Bible as it words of knowledge, words of healings, uh, sorry, words of wisdom, healing, miracles, um, speaking in other languages, faith, etc., etc. Those things still operate today. Those haven't ceased. Um, but um, the new apostles and prophets um, what was I going to say? The, 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 so there is, sorry, prophecy is one of the uh, charismata. That's the point I was going to make, the, the nine gifts of the Spirit. So there are people who still prophesy, but they don't have the office of prophet uh, making them equal in status to the Old Testament prophets who wrote the Bible. So what they say is not automatically canonical, as they would, they would assert, what they say needs to be tested and weighed against Scripture. And if they say something which is contrary to Scripture, then they are a false prophet. Or if they prophesy something that doesn't come true, then again, they are a false prophet. And some of them give prophecies which are so um, general and so vague, or even... <laughs> they actually uh, hedge their bets with their prophecies and uh, in a way which Old Testament prophets would never do. They were very clear and very direct in their prophecies. I'll give you an example. There was a, a prophet associated, a so-called prophet associated with one of these, these mega churches in America who prophesied in 2020, Trump could win the next election. 
but his win could be <laughs> um, thwarted by election fraud. Well, which is it? Is he going to win and become president, or is his, is his win going to be thwarted by election fraud? Okay. Uh, or, you know, which, which is going to happen? Tell us exactly what's going to happen. Not it might be this or it might be the exact opposite thing. He might win, but he might not win. Okay, He might become president again. He might not become president again. That's not a prophecy. That's, that's pretending to be a prophet, but covering yourselves by saying every single possibility might happen. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense you get from some of these people who are saying now that their new age or new apostles and there's a new apostolic reformation um now it can be very very dangerous because you know th these people if they were just you know saying that they were apostles and prophets and then going off and you know edifying the church it wouldn't be such a problem but they are introducing practices and modes and methods into the church which are not Christian. And this is where the big problem lies. Um, I'm going to just uh, play a little clip now from something that happened in Bethel Church in California uh, quite recently. So for those of you who didn't see the movie, so this happens in the fellowship. In the fellowship of the ring. In the fellowship of the ring, at some point, Gandalf stands up and he is in the middle of this, this tomb type of place. And the demon that's been holding court there has, has killed everyone, pretty much, that used to live there. It was the dwarves. He's killed them all. And at, when the demon comes after Gandalf, even the demons flee. The demons flee, they start climbing the walls. And out of nowhere, Gandalf realizes the only thing that will stop this demon is if he stands there and confronts it. Toe to toe, eye to eye, and tells him, this is the line. And the demon is in full authority, in full manifestation of its presence. It's just roaring in front of Gandalf. And Gandalf stands in his authority in front of the demon and says it the first time he hits it and it doesn't happen. The second time Gandalf does it again and still the demon is not obeying. And at the third time Gandalf puts both of his hands on the staff yeah, yeah. and he said, I said, and he hits it. And that authority is what we are talking about that can only be released by an apostolic decree. The authority must be given. And that's why I revealed what we heard tonight. So, Amen. is that clear? Yeah. Thank you. So, please stand up with us. So, if you can stand because you're standing in authority, because you're all kings and priests, and all of us, we're an apostolic people. So, as an apostolic team with the authority that God's given to us, we decree and declare that racism will end, it's over, in the ecclesia from this night forward, in Jesus' mighty name. Let's lift it up and bang it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, give him a praise over. Repeat with us. Thou shalt not pass. No more. Amen. 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 I'm sorry, we did it twice. We need one more. One more. We need you to agree with us. Okay. On the count of three. On three. Shout with us. One, two, two three. The shall not the name of Jesus Christ. So you've got some of the so-called appointed new apostles there on the stage uh, of a mega church. Uh, there's Bill Johnson is one of the people there um, who is the leader of Bethel Church. There's Shay Ann. Uh, there's another, another number of other people. I don't know the names of all of the people there. But what they were doing there was not Christian, clearly. There's the woman who's speaking, and she's watched Lord of the Rings, and she's got a big stick, and she's saying that in order to fight the devil, you need to act like Gandalf the wizard, 
and bang your stick on the ground and shout at the devil and declare, you shall not pass like the wizard in Lord of the Rings. And then she's whipping up the audience to actually participate and shout, you shall not pass, as though this is some kind of prayer. And then there's one of the leaders there saying, I think there's Cheyenne saying, this can only happen. We need the apostolic decrees to make this happen and to fight um, racism in this case or any other things that they want to to, to stop or, or decree or declare um, in order to make things happen. This is not prayer. This is not Christianity. This at best is shouting into the air. At worst, what actually it is doing is it's introducing the methodology of witchcraft and the occult into the church. And it's getting the audience to believe that this is actually a Christian practice when actually it's not. It is a practice of you know paganism, shamanism, witchcraft or new age or occultism, Satanism, if you like. Um, so this is completely inverting what prayer is and what how prayer should be done um and this is a big feature of the new apostolic uh, reformation is trying to create your own reality by making decrees and declares declarations uh, and doing them and saying that this is what prayer is but in the bible it teaches us what prayer is um Philippians 4, 6, 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, known, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when we pray, we give thanksgiving to God for what he's done for us. We bring our prayer requests and supplications to God, and we ask God to do things. That's prayer. Jesus told us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, and that's probably um, one of the most two well-known passages in the Bible, apart from the Ten Commandments, is, is the other one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, you know the Lord's Prayer all the way through. You're, you're speaking to God. You're thanking God you're praising God, you're hallowing God's name, you are saying, please, may your kingdom come on, on heaven. You're asking God, please give us our daily bread. Uh, yours is the glory, the power and the honour. This is like adoration and uh, worship to God. Nowhere does it say in the Bible, name it and claim it, <laughs> and it's yours. Create your own reality, uh, confess it and possess it, decree it and declare it. Um, these things do not come from God. In fact, um, where are we? Uh, it actually teaches us in the Bible not to do this. In fact, Jude one nine, if you know it, says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So it teaches us in the Bible, you don't go and shout at the devil. You bring your petitions and supplications to God. You don't try to change your reality as though your words uh, have creative power on a level with God. God's word has power. We as Christians, as human beings, are to pray to God and ask him uh, for his blessing, for him to act because he is sovereign, he is Lord. Uh, you know, I've I've had to unlearn a lot of things because obviously, re very very recently, because I've been you know an evangelical Christian um, for most of my life, and these things have just seeped in to many many churches around the world, including churches that I've been to. So uh, I've now very quickly unlearned a lot of these practices, which I didn't realise uh, up until now were not biblical, because it's my own fault really for not um, uh, 
knowing the Bible well enough, but I'm very much at the moment getting into reading the Bible a lot to see exactly what the Bible says, rather than, then you can test and weigh what people say when they are on the platform in the church. And the trouble is, there's a lot of people who are these new apostles and prophets in inverted commas they're not really but there's a lot of people who look at them and go because they're on these christian tv channels like god tv and so on all the time um because they do they have a a huge merchandising operation they sell loads of books they sell lots of uh, music tapes and and not tapes but <laughs> music uh, um songs and and worship songs and other christian songs a lot of which contain very very bad theology if you get your christian theology and teaching from these churches and people who have been influenced um without even realizing by the new apostolic reformation you're going to get some teaching some ideas which is false you're going to get false doctrine and false practices coming through and filtering through into your local churches you might just be innocently looking at something and think, oh that sounds good okay i'm just going to do that but it's not in line with scripture and everything has to be tested and uh, weighed against uh, what scripture and what the Bible actually says, so that you are actually practicing true Christian practices rather than occult things which are coming into the church and infiltrating and changing Christianity in, in a way to, to be something that it's not and, and actually uh, pushing it on the way to being something completely the opposite of what it is. You see, they're bringing in witchcraft into the church these kind of practices which need to be completely rejected um the roots of this come from a man called phineas quigley who lived in the early 19th century uh, 1802 to 1866 now he wasn't a christian uh, he was a mentalist uh, which means he he looked at people and uh by their micro expressions and he just um, ascertained knowledge about people by very very careful observation of them um, and he was also uh, an occultist as well but he made you know he was instrumental in this new idea of positive thinking uh, new thought metaphysics that healing sorry that um, sickness and suffering are created in the mind and you can think yourself better. So by your thoughts and your words, you can create your own reality. Now, that's taking something which is true to an extent, but then going well over the boundaries to, of which it is true into something which is um, occult, witchcraft, and completely untrue. So you know, I would certainly say for example, be careful with your words. Even the Bible teaches you that in James. You know, use your tongue for blessing and not for cursing. Be careful not to curse yourself. So, you know, I'm very careful not to say, you know, things like, oh, I feel sick when I'm not. Because you go, or, you know, you, you can see something that you don't like. I mean, I see a lot of things I don't like in politics. You know, I see these drag queens or whatever. And, but I have to, I'm very careful now not to say, look, that makes me sick. Because actually, that's almost like a curse on yourself. So you have to be careful with your words, not curse yourself, not curse other people with your words speak words of blessing to yourself and speak words of blessing to other people and absolutely that's uh, what i would do and um uh advocate for anyone to do but when that goes into saying you know to to areas of unreality that you can create your own reality um that's when that goes beyond <laughs> where this is healthy so what he would say is that you know if you're sick that's because of your mind. You can speak yourself better uh, without God. And, you know, so you can be lying. Uh, you can be dying of cancer 
but someone can say, well, I'm not, I haven't got cancer, I'm well, I'm better. That's unreality. That's not blessing yourselves in reality. That's actually bringing unreality into, you know, j just believing something that isn't true. Um, if, you, if you are ill, you're ill. You have to, you know, acknowledge that, and then you can go to a doctor, and you can get better, and you can also, obviously, positive thinking up to a point is good. But when it gets into creating your own reality, that's when that enters into the realms of the occult, uh, which is not Christian. So Phineas Quigley uh, was one of the, the fathers, if you like, of this new thought metaphysics. And today you, there's a whole range of secular people, Tony Robbins, etc., who are like, yeah, you, 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 can, you, you can be whatever you want to be. You can, you can make your, you, you can create your own reality in your life, in terms of your health, your wealth, etc., um, which for some people, they would get wealthy anyway, or they would be healthy anyway as they are, but it goes into the realms of something which is not real. He's, his philosophy and teaching uh, was very influential in the Christian science movement, which is not Christian and it's not scientific. Scientology church, which is not a church, it's a cult. Um, Napoleon Hill uh, wrote a book in 1937 called Think and Grow Rich, which has been a, a, a huge worldwide bestseller. Um, and it's, it's all about this getting into the mindset uh, and if you have the right mindset, then you will attract health and wealth to yourself. Um, uh, and again, this is without God. It's about you creating your own reality, uh, which is um, not a Christian philosophy. Um, it was brought into the church with the word of faith movement um, earlier in the 50s and 60s. Uh, people like Kenneth Hagan very much instrumental in this word of faith movement which you know the prosperity gospel which many people have heard of that says yeah god will, will make you rich god will make you healthy and uh this will happen if you speak it if you name it you know name it and claim it th these kind of things that i've mentioned before but however what the bible says about um whether we're going to be prosperous is in Philippians 4, 11, 13. And uh, this is what Paul said there. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, poor, and I know how to abound, to be rich. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to be, f to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Paul, the last of the apostles, said there in Philippians, uh, he will be. He has learned how to be content, whether he's rich or poor, whether he's uh, uh, in suffering or in a, a condition of plenty, where he's um, uh, his needs are being fulfilled. He is not seeking from God health and wealth, but he's seeking to do the work that God has given him to do. And that's the attitude that we should have to certainly wealth, <laughs> health and wealth. I mean, God wants to bless us, of course, um, but to try to seek this and make this what the gospel is primarily about is aberrant. It's wrong and it's not uh, what the church should be doing. It's a false teaching. But add on to that... <coughs> word of faith movement which is now developed into the new apostolic reformation and you get all kinds of very bizarre practices which are being brought into the church which are not just about positive thinking but they're actually bringing uh, practices from the occult into the church in order to as I said create your own reality um, which takes the place of God because we're taught, or they are teaching, some of them are teaching, that we are little gods, which is not true. God is God. We are humans. We are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. We are not gods ourselves, 
who can create reality and take the authority of Jesus. We have some authority as Christians, of course, <coughs> but with our prayers, we lay our petitions to God. We don't pretend that we are God and speak as God. We let God be God, and that's what the Bible teaches us. Whereas the New Apostolic Reformation is teaching people, you are little gods, act like a wizard with a stick, and like Gandalf, and declare and shout at the devil and declare your reality. This is not Christian, and it needs to be repented of. And if you have those kind of practices in your church, uh, you need to go and speak to your pastor and um, show him the scriptures, basically. Ask him where this is in the scriptures, and he probably won't find it. What the New Apostolic Reformation has also done is it's created its own Bible. <coughs> like last week with dispensationalism, we looked at how the Schofield Study Bible was written in 1909, and all the notes in there brought in this new doctrine of dispensationalism. The New Apostolic Reformation has a completely new Bible called the Passion Translation, which mangles many, many of the verses and upholds um, the new teachings that the so-called new apostles and prophets, these false apostles and prophets, are bringing in to the church or trying to uh, seed in the real church to change it to become something that is not Christian. Now, you have to be very careful with the Bible. I, most of my life, I've used an NIV, New International Version. I've, I've recently had to repent of that because I didn't even know that actually what that does, the NIV itself, yeah, it's, it's not a, a New Apostolic Reformation Bible, but it misses out many, some 16 Bible verses are missing. They've been written out of the text in the New International Version. If you're using an NIV, go and look up Matthew 17, 21, Matthew 18, 11, Matthew 23, 13, 14. You won't find them because they've been removed from the New International Version and, and many, many other modern versions. You have to be careful with what Bibles you use. I've just recently come to realize that uh, the New International Version and most of the modern versions of the Bible use texts called the Textus Vaticanus and the Textus Sinaiticus, which are full of mistakes and errors. Uh, and uh, so I've now gone to use uh, a Bible which is based on the Textus Receptus and uh, the, the King James Bible and the New King James Bible uh, are based on the Textus Receptus, as is the Geneva Bible. And uh, if you are, in the, you know, if you're an English language uh, student or scholar of the Bible, you, you know that that's the Bible you should be using. Um, if you are, <clears throat> or one of the Bibles you should be using, if you are an English speaker, um, that's just that's another point. Um, which I've just come to realize very recently. So I've I've changed from using a, a new international version to a new King James version, which is based on the Textus Receptus. But the the Message Bible, which was published in the 1990s, that a lot of people are uh, familiar with, and it's the people at the time, I was in churches at the time, said, oh, the message is wonderful, it puts everything into modern language, so people can understand, it's uh, seeker-friendly, it's culturally relevant, but it mangles the text and loses the meanings, the deep meanings that you have in many, yeah, you know, in the original text. You should be using a King James or a New King James version, uh, if you're English, to get as close to the text as possible using the Textus Receptus. But the New Apostolic Reformation has got a new version called the Passion, not the, yeah, the Passion Translation, which is even worse than the message. It, you know, it sounds like it's been written by a TikToker. So, you know, if they are using that version of the Bible that not just mangles the text, but actually imbues in it meanings that are completely different to the original Greek and Hebrew and puts in their own errant 
heretical teachings, then you need to run a mile from that and uh, simply just don't go anywhere near it. So there's much, much more I could say about uh, the New Apostolic Reformation. There are many, many uh, people who do um, critique it uh, much more uh, thoroughly than I've had the time to do today over just about half an hour. But it is something to start thinking about. Has your church been influenced by these so-called new apostles? So if you're influenced by these people who have set themselves up as new apostles or new prophets and uh, creating this loose network, but it actually has a plan to infiltrate every church in the world and bring them into alignment with these new apostles uh, and, uh, and take on their teachings and change Christianity again from the inside, from the other direction almost. You've got cultural Marxism coming at you from one direction, and you've got um, the new apostolic reformation coming at the church from another direction. You've got dispensationalism coming at the church from another direction. So there's these three attacks on traditional Christian orthodoxy and biblical Christianity, which are going on at the moment simultaneously. And what we have to do in order to get back to authentic faith, which is powerful and which will change the world and will make the world better, will spread the gospel of salvation and will establish the kingdom of God genuinely through God's sovereignty, not by pretending that we are little gods ourselves and acting like Gandalf the wizard. If we want to do that, we have to discern a path and avoid all of these three things and that's going to need a lot of skill and a lot of prayer and a lot of wisdom and discernment in order to do that but it can be done and uh, in making these um, little series of three videos which are, I know are not perfect <laughs> I know I've like you know I've not mentioned everything that I can and in my own imperfect way I'm just trying to put out there a warning uh, that there are these three things and probably others as well but these are three prime things which are trying to attack Christianity from the inside and destroy it by turning it into something that it isn't and from three directions just completely pull it apart so there's nothing left but good all God always leaves a remnant of people who are faithful to him and who will um, establish his kingdom on the earth uh, in true faith in the faith of Jesus Christ so I hope that this has been useful uh, to you there's many many more things to say you can look on um, online and find many many videos about it uh, I've read a book recently what's it called counterfeit kingdoms I mentioned it at the beginning by Holly Pivek it's a very good book to read that goes into a lot more detail about the specifics of the abuses of the new apostolic uh, reformation and uh, how it's trying to infiltrate and change Christianity around the world and render it essentially powerless because you know by by doing these things you might feel powerful but you're not powerful because you're not actually uh, moving according to the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit so we need to actually get back to what's authentic so let me know what you think if you got any comments about this um, please do it'll be very interesting to see uh, what you think and maybe this is something you haven't even thought of before and it's something that I wasn't really even aware of much until a couple of months ago and then all of a sudden uh, lots of people started telling me about the dangers of this and I can see now clearly this is a clear and present danger to the church which should be the salt and the light of the earth and the reason why the west is going down the tubes at the moment is because the church has completely abdicated its role as being salt and light in culture. And we need to re-establish that. And we can only do it uh, if we uh, go back to God genuinely and properly.
and not these false apostles and these false prophets. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, God bless you all.